Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Amazing Beer Parlor. Um, so here with me, as usual, is Erasmus. Um, I just want us to kickstart this with, with your feeling about the first episode that we published. Uh, and I see this, I'm able to see the beer parlor at the beginning of this episode because, like, as you know, it, we just came up with the name in the middle of the first recording and then and then we decided to stick with it. So what has been the reaction from your end so far? How do you feel about the performance of the episode? And, and what's your expectation for this one? It's amazing. It's amazing. I love it. I love the shafts. I love <laughs> the beer parlor. I like the fact that we came up with the name right within the, the session. And I think it's a name that's... I resonated with a lot of people. Um, some people actually think um, it's the beer parlor and maybe we discuss the shaft under it. Um, <laughs> it's a sports podcast. I mean, it's still a debate podcast, but I think yeah. I, I like the fact that like de debate minds are able to contribute to yeah. sports or things that we love and enjoy. And both of us love and enjoy this. So always happy to have those conversations and have inputs from people. But yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, for, for me generally, I think um, um, looking at sports, some of us see it like as debaters, we're able to put a much more analytical lens on it to try and have a deeper dive beyond the surface levels into the rationale behind some things, much more accurate projections here and there. And that makes it an interesting conversation, which is also fun for, for a lot of people within the space. And so, yeah, also we, we get to have disagreements, we get to we get to have conversations around our thoughts and opinions, which is also a good expression of what debate has taught us in any way. I think a lot, a lot more people use their debate skills for sporting disagreements than, than <laughs> a lot of people in their lives. So yeah, I, I like, I really love the episode. I think it's one of our best performing episodes so far, and and I have very very good hopes um, for for this one. Also, the reception we got was really really amazing. Lots of people really enjoyed that episode. So. Um, today we'll just have uh, we've we've had a very a very seismic weekend in in the English Premier League. We've had Arsenal Brentford. We've had the top of the table clash between Liverpool and City. We've had for the first weekend in I think eight weeks or so where uh, the 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 league leaders have changed and and Arsenal is now on top of the league. So this episode is mainly to dive deep into the things surrounding the happenings of this weekend. And also talk a, a little bit more about some strange formations we saw with United, um, Ole's interview, and then finally Chelsea, Pochettino discussions around managerial terms. So yeah, this is a really, really packed loaded episode that would shift from various interesting topics to the other. So stick with us and, and you definitely enjoy. Um, first, Arsenal beat Brentford by 2-1. Um, eventually, they are top of the table. But I think one thing that stands out, which I want to ask you about, is, is um, Arteta's decision to bring in David Raya, even though he had Aaron Ramsdale, who did so well last season and was touted as probably one of the best keepers in, in the EPL last season. And it was very strange at the start of the season when um, Arteta went decided to bring Raya on loan. And then all of a sudden, Raya became his first choice. There was a whole lot of conversation about how Ramsdale would feel, about the goalkeeping situations. And Raya was also making some very silly errors at the beginning of the season, which even made the lens on the analysis much bigger because now people were saying, Hatete made the wrong call and all that. It seems to be paying off for him because obviously um, his team has been solid and Raya, I think up until last weekend, had the most clean sheets in the season, in, in, the, in the league. And now you had Ramsdale, who made a silly mistake that nearly cost Arsenal uh, a tabletop winning match. And, and you are wondering, was Arteta right? What's your assessment of it? And do you think um, Ramsdale is really not up to par with Raya? such a Tete's decision is probably the most sensible one to go with. Yeah, I mean, like this whole goalkeeper situation, it, it's, it's it's a big conversation to have and it could almost like fill up the episode. But yeah. I think one thing we need to recognize is that Arsenal wants to challenge for the league this year. Yeah. I don't think last year they were trying to challenge for it at the start of the season. It was the first time that we had seen them because they, they were going for top four and before they realized they were top of the table and they were like, you know what, let's go for the league. And we've seen the 
met the gap or the standard that um, Man City has set within the league, you need to be perfect. Because yeah. these guys yeah. go 16 games, 18 games, 20 games, <laughs> uh, winning streak. Yeah. Uh, close to the uh, close to the end of the season, just to win the title. So you need to be perfect to beat the yeah. city, which means that you cannot allow for any weakness. And the yeah. unfortunate situation for David Ramsdale is is that when he he was brought in before he was brought in, Ateta wanted Raya. He wanted a, a goalkeeper who could play yeah. out from the back, who plays kind of football. But Raya was not available uh, yeah. due to his situation at Brentford so he had to bring in Ramsdale and was sort of like yeah this this is a good goalkeeper second yeah. choice then he overperformed he overperformed <laughs> so now you stick with him or you still go with your first choice and I think he didn't make a good audition for himself towards the end of the season when he committed yeah. a few unders, which saw them sitting five points adrift of the top and still getting to bottle it yeah. which I think to be, I think um Arsenal is a bottling company, so um, Raya was uh, Ramsdale was just a, a cog in the whole <laughs> bottling machine. Plus, let's be very honest: some of uh, the praise we are giving to Raya needs to go to yeah. um, the Arsenal defense yeah, because last month Aliba went out injured. They, yeah. I think they lost Zinchenko, but this yeah. season, like Kevo has has stepped up. Um, Zinchenko is back. Uh, ben White is finally playing like a footballer, and they just seem to be all around very, very solid. So it's an unfortunate yeah. situation, but I think it's something that they need to do because, like, Raya is 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 more elite if we're being honest. Because before, and it's also the mentality, right? That's also another thing I wanted to point out because Raya's yeah. mentality is quite top for for a player who was playing at Brentford. Um, yeah. not too many disrespects, but. Um, Ramsdale is someone who had been involved in a lot of relegation battles, uh, relegation threatening teams, even before getting here. You yeah. could see the difference in quality. So it's about heart or head. And I think Ateta went with his head over here. But it's unfortunate that he made that error at the weekend because I don't think we are yeah. seeing him in the league again. Yeah, I, I, to be very honest, I think that was a really bold move from Arteta because usually managers find themselves in these situations a lot where you probably want a player, you don't get him, you get someone for the interim and then they prove to probably you were wrong about your initial assessment. Maybe they are up for it. And so managers would tend to say, you know what, let me stick with this person rather than maybe go for the one I initially wanted who may not even work out. And especially at the start when mistakes were happening with Raya, and everybody kept on putting in magnifying lenses on the issues of goalkeeping and all that. I, I, I even think maybe Onana saved Raya a lot of backlash because Onana was worse. Onana, yeah. Onana was worse. A, a lovely picture. Um, I think he crossed the 16 mark, so we'll be preparing a pension package for him. <laughs> Onana was worse. But the, you will talk about United in a bit. But then you look at... Um, Eventually, settling with Ryan, his performances has been good. And then Ramsdale is given the opportunity because Raya cannot play against Brentford. And this single opportunity where you need to make a statement, you make this resounding error. And I mean, the team stood with him, but if, if, if and I, I have a feeling it's because probably they won. And so it's easier for them emotionally to do that. But if they had lost or if they have drawn, knowing very well eventually that City and Liverpool drew and this could have been the chance where they go top of the league, it would have been a big issue for, for Ramsdale. And so for me, like you, I don't think he, he gets to make the squad if Raya is fit. I mean, when you think about it, if even if you've lost your place, you know there are two games in the league where you are yeah. short. Yeah, this is Those are shit. yeah exactly. And I can imagine that the pressure that comes in that moment is is extraordinary. But yeah, that's where you need to prove that you are tough. And and like I I I, I mean we'll talk about United and maybe we'll talk about Nana because like there's there's a bit of resurgence maybe in another episode. But yeah. as a keeper, if there's a lot of noise around you, most likely you are not doing a good job. Yeah, a keeper needs to work in silence. The best yeah. keepers work in silence. But so yeah. Yeah, that's all I'll say. I mean, for for me as well, I'm looking at um, Ramsdale's situation and I'm like, 
is it also that because we tend to see this a lot with players who are who are not made to play a lot that they probably end up going out of form right it's not like let's say an outfield player who gets substitution minutes goalkeepers never get substitution minutes which is the issue with, with rams there and so eventually we don't expect him to all of a sudden start a match and be 100 percent fit and, and sharp as he would be similar to when raya came probably this is his beginning of the season raya mistakes right if Ramsdale was playing right from the start, maybe he would make these couple of mistakes at the beginning of the season, and then he would become sharp. He would pick up the pace. He would be very, very aggressive in his goal. And so I tend to think whether or not it is fair on such players who are sat out for long to be blamed or to be criticized when they are brought in and they don't seem to be as much fit as we expect them to be. No, like and before. it's a similar case for, just give me a second, there's a similar case for Calvin Phillips when he was at City, where people used to always say, anytime Pep has given him the opportunity, he hasn't proven himself. And I'm like, look, man sits on the bench for almost decades <laughs> and is made to play one match, maybe the entire season, and you're expecting to all of a sudden be fit and be playing like Rodri would play, obviously that's impossible. So I don't know whether that's a fair judgment on the character of, of players who end up within that situation. Look, football football is a very, very cruel sport. And just like with any space where there's competition, you, you have yeah. to deliver. We're, we're put in unique circumstances and, it, and everyone sort of understands that you've not been playing. So we expect a bit of rust and everything, but you, you need to deliver. That, that that's the thing I was saying in the beginning. You need to be perfect. And if you have a player who cannot handle this kind of situation, because look at uh, Kevin Kelleher for Liverpool. Yeah. Alex went out injured and he's been amazing. In fact, yeah. it looks like he's he's yeah. you notice the difference. Like, the absence of Alisson because he's, yeah. he's doing an amazing so, job. Part of what it means to be a very good squad player, some of these big clubs, and there's a reason why even they pay their squad players more. Chelsea pays yeah. their squad players more than players who play full time in in Everton yeah. or, or West Ham. So it tells you that there are standards that need to be adhered to, and there's certainly no excuse for that. Of course, no one expects you to be of the same quality as the players on the pitch, but there's a reason why you are paid to be a squad player in, in that instance. When you get there, you need to deliver, and that and that's it. Yeah, I mean, to be very honest, I I genuinely don't think, even if they are paid to be squad players, there are some some things that are natural. Like, assuming a, a debate company picks you and decides to make you debate for them, and you are sat on the bench for a very long time, even if you are paid, bro. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll, I'll send you. I mean, we need to move on from this, but I'll send you to uh, we send one. We sat out for so long since November, like even before yeah. November, we sat out for so long. We went to African Nations League. We were in the final. Yeah. We lost the final and we were still very, very hurt. We sat out for so long and we went out to IBA um, Grand Prix. And we won the tournament. The first, our first speeches, we couldn't even string sentences Yeah, so together. that was Ramsdale's first speech. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, it, I it, it was a tournament and we turned up and we, we still won. We still won in that room. So for yeah, me, well, you just need to deliver. Yeah, moving on from, from Ramsdale, there are two players who were influential in that win against Brentford. Um, obviously, Declan Rice is proven to, to, to meet up to the price tag and Kai Havertz scoring the winning goal. First, let's start with Kai Havertz because you guys sold him. Chelsea, you, you, he wasn't delivering for you guys. You sold him to Arsenal. Arsenal is not playing with a clear out-and-out striker now. And Kai Havertz seems to be one of the people who have stepped up in recent games, delivering goals and assists for them and putting in very, very impressive performances. What's your take on his impact on this current Arsenal team and the form that they are on? Look, Kai Havertz is my player. Like, a lot of people don't know this, but I personally love the guy. Like, I, yeah. I love him to bits, right? But yeah. he is a kind of player who functions in a defined structure, in a structure that works. When things are going well for the team, Kai Havertz will do so well. And it was seen when uh, when he was brought in into, was it Lampard's yeah, yeah, yeah. team? When we brought him straight away from Leverkusen and it seems we were all over the, the, the pitch. 
habits was lost merely to show yeah. brought in stability yeah. habits started thriving in the germany yeah. team remember he was doing so well and then when germany started having their crisis habits was just like dysfunctional when the system worked habits is unplayable he's one of the most talented players that i know and he's clutch because he's the kind of player who puts his head down and just works very, very hard. He's a very, very, very hard worker. I, I don't know how he got the tag of being very lazy, but he's a very, very hard worker. But I also yeah. think he has a feeling. Like, he's, he's a generational talent, in, in my opinion, but he has yeah. a ceiling. Because what he does is different from every other player. Um, yeah. Like, he's a player who finds space. So, I mean, Thomas Muller was using a way that he, he was, like, top yeah, scorer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way he plays the game, he he's not required to like give you GNA yeah. all of the time. Yeah. So um I think that was one of his problems at Chelsea. Due to the instability, there was no way he could do it. But another point Chelsea fans have been making is that this is March habits. Every time within a period from March <laughs> to about um April <laughs> May he'll pick, up. He'll pick <laughs> Amazing run of form, like scoring every game. I remember last season or last two seasons, like against New Newcastle, then he scored this tapper goal. Yeah. Amazing. But before that, he'll be yeah. statue. So I get that Arsenal fans are excited and they want to rub it in Chelsea fans' faces, but they were crying at the beginning of the season and they need to remember that they, they don't watch Chelsea games, and that's how come I'm convinced that people don't watch Chelsea games because Havertz plays yeah. incredible. All, all these things that they're saying, they should watch the games where Havertz played for Tuchel. He was incredible yeah. in terms of his ball carrying, in terms of his ability to utilize the space and create space for his teammates. And he's virtually on the same goal tally in a proper team that is challenging for the title. And they say 65 million was good money, given that we paid, I think, um, 79 or 80 for him and he scored a Champions League winning goal for us. And he's probably the... Yeah. the only people who have a Champions League medal in that team are Chelsea players, so they should put some respect to their names and we'll use their money. Hey, as well. What has Arsenal done to you? Because you just first you started with Arsenal, a bottling company, and, <laughs> and Ramsdale is just corking the bottle bottle line. And now you, you literally picked Havertz's scoring streak and, and you've rubbed it in their face. But I mean, for me, those kinds of players tend to be harshly judged sometimes. And they are not players who... They are offensive players, but they are not goal-scoring machines. And their importance to the team is usually during off-the-ball movements, in what do you call it, pressing styles, um, applying pressure and working hard and all that. And it's, it seems like we've been tunnel-visioned into always judging a forward's play based on how many goals he scores, mm -hmm. right? And this comes down to players like Gabriel Jesus. I don't know why Gabriel Jesus doesn't score that many goals in a season. But when he's playing, you'd see his influence on the team. You'd see his playmaking, his link-up play, his pressing, his working hard. And sometimes when these players, when teams are not scoring goals, I don't think these players should be the ones we blame. Sure, he would miss chances, but that's the thing. He's not a prolific goal scorer. You don't expect him to tap in and score every single chance like Ellen Haaland would do or like Victor Simon would do. And so if he misses the chances, that's not his strength, right? It's like recently a conversation that has been happening about, oh, um, Bruno Fernandes doesn't keep the ball. He loses the ball too much. He's a playmaker. Playmakers are easily dispossessed. They are risk takers. They always want to ping the ball one way or another, try risky things. And it's similar to why De Bruyne was taken up by Pep and De Bruyne wasn't happy. But Pep's defense, he wanted to control the ball. And De Bruyne is not the person who controls the ball for him. Yeah. And so I just think generally, football fans should start understanding the expertise of certain technical players and know what metrics you judge them by and stop judging a playmaker by his ball retention. He is not Rodri to be dictating the the piece of play. Um, but finally, let's talk about uh, Arsenal's position on the table now. I mean, currently they are topping the table. They have one key match, which I think will probably be much more season-defining, which is their trip to the ATR um, to go and play in Man City. And if they win that clash, they are probably convincingly done with City. City. I mean, but unless they mess up somewhere, which is Currently unlikely given the run of form because currently Arsenal has scored 
more goals in 2024 alone than United has scored the entire season. That's, <laughs> that's first of all, how incredible Arsenal have been. And secondly, that's how terrible United have been. <laughs> so, I think they're on a very, very interesting run. And I don't know whether you think they can go to the Etihad and do it. No. Wow. Wow. This is a board called... Well, the answer is simple, no. Um, like, we all saw the, like, tradition, like, you need to understand that um, the way the Arsenal and City clash has been, it, it's like, yeah, these are challenges. You see how Liverpool goes toe-to-toe with City now. It's quite yeah. clear, you can't call it. So Arsenal is now gaining that trajectory, and I just don't think they are ready uh, um, in, enough. We saw the game they had at the Emirates. It came yeah. off a different shot. I think now they've, they've, they've gotten better at just being able to um, contain City. But I just yeah. think Pep is brilliant. Like, Pep, Pep is brilliant. And the only way I see them beating City is the, I've realised that the Man City team is is beginning to struggle a bit with some of the top six sides. Mostly yeah. because it looks like they, the more they got better at breaking down some of these um, smaller sides, they've got a bit worse at playing because they used to be very good at beating uh, yeah. the big teams. And then like they had these boogie teams from Sheffield, things like that. And they got better at it. And it looks like they are declining a bit here. Yeah, And it's because the way they play now, they're so focused on the attacking play. Um, they don't like it when a team takes the game to them. So we saw the game with Chelsea at the had, where yeah. Alaga was all over Rodri. We saw yeah. yesterday when, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Endo. Uh, Endo and McAllister were all over Rodri, just not giving him the room to, to di- dictate the pace of the game. And it's quite clear that when Haaland is playing higher up the pitch, it's way yeah. less effective than in the box. So your best bet is to push them back. And they they tend to push back a bit when they realize that you can find the attacking transitions. And yeah. once you yeah. find the spaces to play in between them, you, you know you punish them. And I think Arsenal has the capacity to do that. But yeah. it's, it's hard. For me, I have, I have yeah. one question for you, though. Like, at what point should City start getting scared of Arsenal. Because I think, granted, from last season's performance, I don't think Arsenal deserved that fear factor from any of the top teams, and maybe United. But if you if you look at, there's a team that eventually comes of age. And sometimes it elopes you when a team comes of age. And the time you grasp that they've come of age, you would have already suffered the consequences, right? City... Liverpool probably feel the two of them are the most threatening. But maybe Arsenal has come of age, and this is the season to prove it. But we can't tell because we don't have any prior records to, to, to back that. And that's one of the most risky situations any opponent can find themselves in. When the person you are competing against is better than they were, they've come of age, they are genuine contenders, but you can't prove whether or not they are. So at what point should City start being scared of Arsenal? And at what point should we say, sure, Arsenal is a threat, let's start paying more attention to them? Yeah, like, I think Arsenal is a threat now. Like, I'm a Chelsea fan, but I know if we play, like, we are not winning. Because, yeah. like, Arsenal has, is a well-coached team. I think that's, that's yeah. what it is. Like, some of the players they have would not do well when put in other yeah. teams. Yeah, yeah. Ateta has a way of coaching players that gets all of them overperforming. For God's sake, Ben White is <laughs> playing as a right back and he's like balling God's sake. eyes out. So, yeah. I think there's a point at which these players tend to gain some maturity and, and of course, they've gained the maturity start winning trophies and we're going to yeah. see that. But we saw them bottle it in the FA Cup. We saw them bottle it in the Carlin Cup. I think they need to start getting out of that out of their heads and and maybe because uh, right now most of Arsenal's attacking prowess comes from them playing that sort of like two three five formation where yeah. they overload the boxes. You, yeah. that's what they did against City like last season and City won four one because 
City just found yeah. ways. In you just transition and they are done. In, against them and find the, the pockets of spaces um, beside the center backs, and then they were going through. Obviously, now it's it's a bit it's a bit harder because like City is, is struggling, but you can't play that way against. You need to have a level of defensive solidity and be available yeah. to be very very explosive on the counter attack. If Jesus plays, I think they stand a very good chance. If Havertz plays, tends to slow down counter attacks a bit. But I mean, he scored the winning goal against City in the Champions League final, so I'm sure he's the one. Who really, let people's fans rest. But I mean, for for me, one thing that's reassuring for us now, for me, is that first of all, they've done something that Pep used to do over the seasons when he's won titles, picking his team at the right time, and this second half of the season is where Arsenal has peaked. Just imagine, they are not playing with an out-and-out striker, but they are they have more goals than the top three, right? They are leading the goal difference tally, which shows you that they've peaked around the very, very right time where they are the ones recording these six, five, five, very high goal margins. And secondly, this time of the season was when last season they were experiencing injuries, and so a lot of the big guys were going off. This time round, they are actually welcoming back people from injury. Thomas Partey has started being into, incorporated into the team. You are looking at um, some of the other big guys who are coming back gradually. Gabriel Jesus, who was also injured, sometimes is now picking up his pace. And you look at this, and then you are wondering: this is more like a flip of what happened last season, and it was probably the key that Ateta missed in the previous campaign that they had where and like you said maybe took them by surprise they weren't expecting to be title contenders all of a sudden they fired themselves there and they need to match up to it and and now they are primed for it because i think the conditions surrounding the time they've picked the kind of players they have coming back and the kind of solid backbone that they have because now imagine taking um, um Declan rice off and bringing in thomas party as a replacement that's that's solid, right? Meanwhile, last season, you take Thomas Partey off and ask who are you or if he's injured. And we saw it. Anytime he was injured, it really affected Arsenal's style of play because there was no proper holding midfielder who could control and dictate the pace of the game. But I think they have backstops to the challenges now, which is helping them. Yeah, That's yeah, good. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I was just about to say, like, I, I agree. I think they're in a much, much better position to challenge now. And it's yeah. quite clear for me. I think there's a title race in there, and, and Arsenal is, is in it too, too. But they need to win against City. For me, they need to win against City. It's this is the first time I've heard you say something positive about, yeah. about Arsenal as a team, but they should just know their place. That's all. <laughs> um,